Well, good morning. My name is Doug, and this is Emerald Hill Skies. It's kind of early, isn't it? It's, uh, well, it's late to get started. I wanted to start at 4 a.m., and you've been patient. It's 4.10 a.m. I've not really gotten up in the morning like this to observe during this time of the night before, and I'm looking forward to trying this. Always before our live streams, our observing sessions have started basically um, in, uh, in the front part of the night, and we would be able to try to look forward into the evening. So this is the first time I've ever slept first and then gotten up in the later part of the night. So let's see what this is like. Um, let's see, uh, you already know about our scope, I bet if you've been on the channel before, it's a Rasa 11, and you can see it there on top of a Ioptron CEM70G mount, uh, which is bolted to a, um, uh, a, a pure tech adjustable height pier. And it's all located uh, right outside this building in a uh, pure tech telestation two. It's about 200 feet away and we're connected to it uh, underground through fiber optic cable. In the right hand side of the screen, of course you see me and below me on the left is a live view of the sky. And that's taken through, uh, not through the Rasa, but a, a camera that's riding on top of the Rasa kind of like this. You can see the Rasa optical tube assembly with the dew shield on the front. You see that little assembly on top? That's this uh, red um, ASI, uh, ZWO ASI 178 monochrome camera with the uh, all sky lens on it, about 150 degree lens. And you can see there the Pegasus Astro uh, power box on top of the Pegasus Astro USB controller. And those data cables feed down into a, what you might call a rig rack. And uh, that rig rack has, you know, the various power supplies and also a little device that converts the data into the uh, signal that can run over the fiber optic cable and come in here. And then in my office here, in our prayer center and atrium here at Emerald Hills, uh, we have the counterpart to that little device that converts the signals from that fiber optic signal back into something that can uh, can look like a normal USB signal. So I'm gonna check here and uh, just see if our audio is live. Yeah, that sounds good. And uh, we're gonna get started. The first thing we're gonna do, since I didn't get here as early as I would have liked this morning, <laughs> we're gonna try to focus. So let's get you back here on the screen and let's open up um, Nina. Uh, Nina is, um, it stands for Nighttime Imaging and Astronomy. And first thing we'll do is we'll connect to the camera. Looks like that went okay. Now we're gonna try to connect to the focuser. The camera we use is a ZWASI um, 2600 MC Pro. It's an astronomical, an astronomy specific camera. That's our last autofocus routine. So let's start this autofocus routine. And if you've been on the channel before, you know Nina has these uh, plugins that you can use to accomplish different things. And one of the most recent plugin that that has been um, filed there at Nina is the Hocus Focus plugin. I can see actually there's a there's an update to it. You know what I should do is let's stop this autofocus routine and let's go over and do this update real quick. Um, Focus, focus. Uh, well, I said there was an update, but yeah, there we go. So we're gonna check for updates. Update. Gonna update the Hocus Focus routine. And this uh, little routine, Hocus Focus, is being programmed by George Helios. And uh, we're, um, okay, reconnection, OBS Studio. Okay, I think, I wonder if we have to, yeah, requires restart. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to restart, Nina, and then we'll see if our equipment reconnects. No, it didn't, so there's the camera, and there's the focuser. 
and uh, welcome to the broadcast. If you're just coming on, my name is Doug, and we're speaking to you today from Emerald Hills, just on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. Now let's start the autofocus routine. If you're on the chat and uh, willing to do so, it'd be great if you could say where you're listening from. That'd be really interesting to hear that. Okay, so what's happening? Uh, if you've been on the channel before, you know, <clears throat> you know how this works. Um, our telescope, which is uh, here, our telescope takes a picture of the night sky. And then uh, Nina uh, changes the position of the focuser. So uses the motor to change position of the mirror. Hey, there's Kim from Australia. Welcome. Good to have you aboard, Kim. Thanks for, thanks for uh, stopping by. Um, the motorized focuser changes the position of the mirror, takes another picture, compares the two. And what Hocus Focus is trying to do is find uh, a picture with the tiniest stars. Because what's the definition of focus? Well, pinpoint stars. So if the stars are fuzzy and round, then uh, Nina's... Hocus Focus subroutine um, knows, plug-in knows that we haven't reached critical focus yet. And what it'll do, it'll keep going to one side until those um, fuzzy stars get bigger and bigger. And what happens when they get bigger? There's more and more luminance in each of the little star patterns that uh, Hocus Focus finds. So then what it does, it goes back to the beginning where it started and it starts going the other way. Uh, pulling the mirror in, and that's what you're watching now on the screen. It has found what it feels like are the definitely the end of focus on one end, and it's come back to the beginning, and it's saying, okay, I'm going to start here again, and I'm going to try the other way now. By the way, there is a bit of cloud up there. I don't know if you can see. Well, in that picture, it looks like most of the clouds are gone, which is exactly as forecast. The uh, forecast called for um, most of the clouds to be gone at four. But when I got here uh, a few minutes before four and rolled back the, the roof on the observatory, um, I don't know if you've seen that observatory before. If you've been on the channel, perhaps you have. It's a roll-off roof observatory. And when I rolled back the roof this morning, this is not a live view that you're looking at. These are pictures taken in the daytime, so you can kind of get a feel for the place. Um, there were still a lot of clouds in the sky, and I kind of felt bad. I said, oh my goodness, you know, I just bragged on this weather app uh, yesterday. <laughs> but sure enough, it looks like that most of them are gone. You can see the scope on top, that adjustable height pier. And in that picture, it's it's dialed all the way up, as you can see. So uh, that's the way it is right now. If we could look at a live view, it's out there in the observatory. There's not a lot in the observatory. There's a little screen over there to the left and a keyboard shelf that we can use when we're inside the observatory. Uh, you know, tuning the scope or something. But other than that, it's pretty empty. And we are not in the observatory. We're uh, inside in the warm. It's pretty cold out there. What is it? 33.3 uh, Fahrenheit. So what would that be? About uh, a half degree centigrade. Well, it looks like uh, our focus is pretty happy. And I kind of like this curve. Uh, I might need to adjust it so we don't take quite so many uh, tourism stops on this part of the curve <laughs> takes a little bit longer, doesn't it, than what we would have to, but <clears throat> at least I think it has found happy focus. And I'm going to unhook or disconnect the focuser on the camera and leave Nina. And now let's go back into sharp cap. Um, this is sharp cap that I've got open for the main camera, the 2600 MC Pro. And there you see stars. Fun stuff. Um, let's make that screen a little bit larger. And uh, boy, that is, um, I'm going to just uh, zero in on some of those stars just to make sure. Yep, those do look good. Pinpoint stars. So thank you, George and Helios, George Helios and Focus, focus. I think this all looks good. I think we're ready to go. So we'll go over here into our planetarium software, which is Starry Night Pro. And what we do is we search for the word lists. 
And that brings up all our observing lists. And then we go to Caldwell Working. And this is our working list of Caldwell objects. You'll see it go through a bit of a sorting process there. What it's doing is trying to find all of the Caldwell objects that it thinks are above the horizon right now. And now we've sorted by clicking on the top of that column for uh, altitude. We've sorted uh, to try to find the Caldwell objects that are highest in the night sky. Another thing we need to do is go over to our telescope control and click connect. Try to connect to our telescope. And you'll see it's kind of thinking there for a second. By the way, we'll welcome also to Jim from Black Hill, South Dakota. Jim, it's great to have you aboard. It's been a while since we've seen you here on one of the live streams. There we go, our scope is connected. And what this is doing now is our planetarium software is talking to the mount. Uh, that um, that uh, black um, chunk of metal underneath the tube that does the pointing, now uh, thankfully our planetarium software is talking to it. So we're gonna go over to, looks like C27 is highest in the sky. So let's center on C27. And we'll put a little check mark in that box. Let's also slew over to C27. You can see the live view through the uh, M, the uh, ASI uh, 178 monochrome camera. You can see the the scope there is turning in the observatory, starting to get a, a bead on um, Caldwell 27. Another thing we'll do is we'll show info on C27. It looks like it's a diffuse nebula, and it's sometimes called the crescent nebula or the dividing cell nebula. How interesting. So we'll just stick this over here kind of out of the way. I wonder where's the best place to put that. Maybe put it right there for a minute. How about that? Um, let's go over here to our observing software, which is SharpCat Pro where we've got the um, ASI 2600MC Pro um, connected. And let's put in C27 here in the, in the subject line of SharpCap. We'll also say C27, which is also known as NGC 6888. And it's a diffuse nebula. Okay, and sometimes I've been forgetting to go back to the screen there once we get that title in place. So I don't want to forget that this time. Let's do what's called a plate solve. We'll connect sharp cap to the mount, and it talks to the mount in order to um, reposition it if necessary. And what we're doing now is taking a picture of the night sky through sharp cap. It's connecting it to our software and comparing all those pinpoints of light with what, with what it thinks they should be. And if if it finds that those pinpoints aren't where they where the telescope would expect them to be, what SharpCap does is repositions them out. And it did by 3.25 degrees. And I always say up front, if that sounds a little bit sloppy, it's because this is our first target. And we don't do any kind of um, two-star alignment or three-star alignment. Um, here at Emerald Hill Skies, we just Polar line, of course, the scope stays polar lined in the observatory now. And then we go to the night sky with sharp cap. And we let sharp cap do the heavy lifting of uh, kind of doing our alignment for us by using this uh, plate solving. So now we are where we expect to be. We can go up here into the sequencer and we can say start imaging. While that's starting, let me go down and see if Jedi Scope, Jedi SCP. Hello, dog. I'm listening from Sintra near Lisbon, Portugal. Keep doing these magnificent live streams. I've been learning. Oh my goodness, Jetty Scope, that's very kind of you to say. I feel like I'm kind of a fellow struggler with you. I'm, <laughs> I'm like an explorer, not a guide, but it's so kind of you to encourage, um, encourage the broadcast. And I got to say 4 a.m. here is probably what? About 10 a.m. for you there. So thanks for tuning in. I hope uh, where you are, you're enjoying your morning. Uh, you can see that what we've done is we've basically instructed SharpCap to start imaging the night sky using 
20 second exposures at 100 gain. And down here at the bottom, we have what's called the histogram. And we can tune for color. It actually looks pretty well tuned, but we'll just check it to make sure. We can get our uh, lights kind of out of the way. And our mids aren't bad. Look at the nice peak we have on our colors all aligned now. So we'll bring our darks over here toward the top of that crest. And then we'll bring our mids up. I still don't see any. Oh, I think I'm starting to see an object. So we'll push that just a little bit. It's right there in the center of the frame. Let's, uh, let's zoom in on this a bit. That's at 60%. Look at that. How fun is that? That's 100% of our camera's pixels. And uh, we can probably try to bump these mids up a little bit more. Oh, we're seeing two parts of this nebula. Look, there's nebula there. And then there's some nebulosity here. And then here's this crescent. I can't remember the last time I looked at this, but over here in our observing notes, we should be able to find that. Looks like we observed this on September the 10th, 2021. Saw the whole crescent. And then on April 2nd, uh, interesting when first slew their scope, didn't find it. Had to re-slew and resolve. Beautiful nebula. Wow. And then on August 5th, amazing. So what we're going to do here in our observing software is we're going to go up here to observe and say sessions. And you see our last session was 61. And uh, I believe that's our last session, part three, yes. So we're going to start a new observing session. We're going to call it 0062 Caldwell Catalog Part 4. And uh, timing-wise, we'll just... Um, We'll set the timing forward a few hours just so we're out of the way. And we'll say first morning observing session. I can tell you right now, I don't like my uh, contact lens as much for this fine work. So we're in session 62. So I'm going to go over now and it says uh, change observing session. And we're going to change to that one we just did. Just 62. There we go. Now, once we, um, once we tell Starry Night Pro that we're going to use that observing session, now it's going to, whoops, I was changing the last observation. That's sad. Uh, I'm going to change that back. I think when I opened it, it said 26. And to be honest, I wondered, why is that randomly on 26? What I need to do is start a new observe. Oh, and it picked up that we're on 26, that's as it should be. And then uh, in terms of an associated observing list, let's go to the Caldwell list, Caldwell catalog. And the other thing we wanna do is go down here and say, um, we wanna tell uh, Starry Night Pro we're using the Ross 11, I don't know what other scope I would be using. And then um, in the notes, Let's say, wow, we saw this uh, right away in the first frame. And wow, look at the way that is, um, look at the way that is sorting up. I'm going to use, go a little bit beyond our normal zoom here and what we might call um, digital zoom, you know. This is 150% of our camera's capabilities now. And let's brighten that up if we can a little bit more. Somebody told me the other day that there was a brightness control. I don't remember using it before. Hmm. I don't see any brightness control. You guys that have... Um, Sharp cap experience, if there's anybody on, there's Rowan Prangley. Rowan, good to have you aboard. Uh, thanks for being here, Rowan. And Simon. <laughs> yes, this is an early one, Simon. I actually slept in the front part of the night. Okay, Kim, we'll see you after dinner. I slept in the front part of the night, and now we got up at um, 
3 a.m. To, to, to observe here in the, the second part of the night. Look how this is starting to look like it's on fire. Well, in reality, that's what it is. It's basically a bunch of uh, hydrogen gas is being lit up by uh, all these uh, stars around it. It's being ionized by these bright stars. So in a way, it is on fire. Um, let's read something about this nebula. We'll go over here under the description and we'll see what Sharp Cap can say. NGC 6888 in Cygnus is an emission nebula known as the Crescent Nebula from its distinctive shape. It is located 5,000 light years from the sun, and in the telescope it appears a faint curved wisp through a parallelogram of stars, a narrow band nebula filter, and really dark skies are essential to spot it. I want to tell you, we do not have really dark skies. We're on the edge of Louisville, Kentucky, which is Bortle 6, but we're using a... Um, a uh, light pollution filter, a Celestron light pollution filter. But the other thing that's haunting us tonight is the moon. I don't know what the moon is. Uh, let's just uh, go check it out here real quick. I'm going to go look at the moon and I'm uh, going to bring up clear outside. It's a handy thing. 91%. So the moon is at 91% luminosity. It is super bright. I don't know how we're seeing this other than the wonder of uh, EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy. Now, this is not the Veil Nebula, is it? This is the Crescent Nebula, so that's different. Caldwell 27, the Crescent Nebula. I think this is beautiful. Uh, I remember in the Veil Nebula, it has like an east and a west portion like this, doesn't it? Tell you what let's do. Let's, let me make sure I'm grabbing the right title bar here. Yeah, let's move that down a little bit. Let's go over here to um, read about uh, C27, which is also called NGC 6888. And let's read about this just for a second. The Crescent Nebula, also known as NGC 6888, Caldwell 27, Sharpless 105, is an emission nebula in the constant thickness about 5,000 light years from discovered by William Herschel in 1792. It is formed by the fast stellar wind from the Wolf Riot star WR136, which is also known as HD 192-163. I'm going to go over here to um, our planetarium software, and let's zoom in. I bet that star that they're talking about is none other than this one of these two stars here. Um, tell you what, it wants to it wants to center on that, and that's pulling it out of the center. There we go. Look how beautiful this thing is. Look how much nebulosity there is. How how large this is. I wonder how this is 20 arc minutes wide. That would be what? A third of a degree wide. By night sky things, that's huge. A third of a degree. That's big. And this Hipparchus 995.46. Um, let's look at the info on it. I wonder if that's the Wolf Riot star or is it this one? Tycho 3151. You know, I kind of wish... We don't often get the HD numbers um, in Starry Night Pro. HD 192163. I'm just kind of curious. I'm going to save that to my clipboard and look that up in a second. Uh, colliding with energizing the slower moving wind ejected by the star when it became a red giant around 20, uh, 250,000 around 250, to 400,000 years ago, the result of the collision is a shell and two shock waves, one moving outward and one moving inward. The inward moving shock wave heats the stellar to X-ray emitting temperatures. It is a rather faint object located about two degrees southwest of Seder. For most telescopes, it requires a, a UHC or an O3 filter to see it. Under favorable circumstances, which we do not have, 
due to our light pollution in the moon, a telescope as small as eight centimeters can find it. Uh, can see its nebulosity. Larger telescopes of 20 centimeters more, uh, which is by God's grace what we have, reveal the crescent or a Euro sign <laughs> shape, which makes some to call it the Euro sign nebula. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Okay, let's look at real quick at what the Hubble night sky saw, the Hubble, the Hubble telescope saw. We'll go to C27. Oh my goodness, look at this. Oh wow, look at that. It's beautiful. Of course, this is using the Hubble palette. Look how the Hubble was so tight in, it couldn't even see the whole nebula. Uh, 20 arc minutes of, of the night sky. You see what an arc minute is, it's measuring the arc, the amount of arc that the night sky covers with 180 degrees being the whole night sky, one degree being 180th. This is 20 arc minutes, which would be one third of a degree. That was too big for the Hubble telescope. And you notice the Hubble telescope always has this little um, chunk out of the corner because this one camera is higher resolution and uh, it shows up in this quadrant as a higher resolution frame. And they all look like this, but what a beautiful picture, right? And it shows where it is there in Cygnus right there in the main part of the swan, the swan's body. Wow, so this is beautiful. Well, there's 11 minutes on this object. We've we spent a little bit more time on this object, but part of that is because it is so beautiful. Uh, I don't know if we could tune this a little bit higher and get just a little more pop, not much, but that's already really a beautiful image, isn't it? Just to be able to Enjoy that. Now look how we're starting, but it's just the beginning to pick up this nebulosity here. See that over here in our planetarium software to the right? Look at that object, that's beautiful. That's just a part of a, I guess, either a star that's shining through from the back, but you can see that nebulosity around it. Let's zoom in on that just for a minute. This is our live view that we're zooming in on. Obviously we're overreaching the pixels of our camera. But look at all of that beauty. Wow, this is really nice down here. It just really looks like a flamethrower down there, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so let's go over to our, um, our uh, notes that we're keeping here and let's say, let's add to it and say, wow, the, um, what would that be? The west side, the lower left hand side, which I think, I can never keep all these directions straight, the west side looked a lot like a flamethrower. Uh, but really, all of this arc was incredible. And uh, just for the sake of um, making sure we we do this, we're gonna to go to images and we're gonna look up a Euro sign, Euro symbol. So there's a Euro symbol and you'll have to decide if you think that Euro symbol looks like this, well, I can see, right? Here's the, here's the Euro sign and here's the, the little stripe <laughs> across it, these stars and that one too kind of makes a second stripe. I kind of see their point. Okay, we're gonna save this uh, exactly as seen. You know, this really is a treasure. Uh, can't you understand why um, Sir Patrick Moore, Sir Patrick Caldwell Moore would have said, this object deserves to be in some list somewhere. And when Charles Messier made his list, which was the, the not comet list, as he was observing in 1760s from atop his hotel in Paris, due to the light pollution and whatever other reasons, the fact that he was only looking through a homemade, well, they were all homemade back then. There were no telescope companies. The fact that he was observing through a homemade telescope three and a half inches wide or so, he didn't see this and he didn't catalog it. So Sir Patrick Moore, Sir Patrick Caldwell Moore said, Let's put it in a list. And he made it Caldwell 27. So thank you, Sir Patrick Caldwell Moore. Okay, so we're gonna back up here under sequencer and we're gonna take this back to next target. And uh, as you can see, that switched us back to now three second exposures at 400 gain 
And this is just so we can get our bearings. We're going to go back to auto and go back over to our planetarium software. Oh, one thing we need to do. Uh, let's don't forget, we need to go to our Caldwell um, working list and uh, spread it out here. Why? Uh, oops, that's the wrong one. That's observed. We want to do the working list. And we want to go back to C27. And I'm going to close that. Where is C27? I lost it. Oh, that's Caldwell Observed. Sorry, I was confused. Um, Caldwell Working List is the list we want. And close this one. C27. And we want to say, add this to the Caldwell observed list. And then over here in um, our browser, we want to go to Live Sky. And what we do, because Starry Night Pro doesn't have a working observed column, we actually go to observing lists here in uh, Live Sky, which is kind of a, a um, <clears throat> sort of a switchboard between um, data for Starry Night Pro and Sky Safari. And it's free for the folks of simulation curriculum. Thank you. We're going to click on Caldwell working list and edit it. And in the search, we're going to say 27. And since we already saw it, we're going to remove it from the working list. And I'm going to look back up and see we are in the working list. We're going to save it. And it doesn't remove immediately, but it will remove eventually. So we're done with C27. And let's go to our next object, which it looks like uh, in the night sky in terms of altitude would be C12. Put a little check mark there and we're going to slew to C12. There you can see the sky is turning. Well, actually the sky is not turning. You're turning in the telescope. And uh, there you are. It's pointing kind of in a northeasterly direction there. You can see the way the camera's mounted in the observatory. It shows sort of looking across the back of the telescope like as if it's a rifle sight. And then we'll also center on C12 here in our planetarium software. Kim, my goodness. Um, oh, you're not back yet. You said back after dinner. <laughs> Thanks to you all observing with us. Uh, a lot of our uh, folks who are European friends and folks down in Australia and also uh, folks out west who managed to stay up late. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks to you guys who stayed up late. It's good to have you aboard. So C12 is our next object. Um, let's open up the information panel on C12. It looks like it's a spiral galaxy. So we'll go back to Sharp Cap and Sharp Cap, of course, followed along with us. So we're going to say C12 in Sharp Cap. And while that's plate solving, we'll go down here to the title and say C12, otherwise known as NGC 6946, a spiral galaxy. And um, looks like we were off just 0.19 degrees. That's more like it. So you see, with this approach that we use, the first target was almost three degrees off, but the second one now is just 19 hundredths of a degree off. So we've already got our titles in. Let's go to our sequencer, sequencer and go to Start Imaging. And uh, again, if you use SharpCap Sequencer, you already know this. Uh, but if you're just getting used to SharpCap for some reason, or if you're uh, uh, maybe new to astronomy, uh, SharpCap gives you the ability to basically create a macro. It's not really programming per se, but it's, uh, yeah, it's programming a series of steps that happen in sequence automatically. And one of the things we can do is say, switch to a longer exposure, lower the gain to a gain the camera likes, uh, open up the uh, uh, live stacking uh, process, which stacks one frame on top of another, and uh, then let us start observing, you know. And so we clear the um, live stack engine from what it was doing last. Boy, look at this neat cluster. Is that what we're 
Whatever cluster that is, that's beautiful. That must be NGC 6939. I'm looking over at the planetarium software and I can see in our frame, that is a beautiful little cluster. Wow, that should have been on Messier's list too. That's incredibly nice looking. Uh, we'll just do another color balance just to check out this part of the night sky. I think I might have seen a hint of nebulosity there in the middle from that spiral galaxy. Uh, let's make our black level a little bit more, not too much. We've got these mids cranked up really high. And uh, let's focus in on this part of the frame as our region of interest. So there's 100%. Sure enough, you can see something there, can't you? Oh my goodness, yeah, you can start to see the galaxy come out already. I don't know if you can see it across the um, YouTube um, channel, but I'm already seeing spiral arms after just 100 seconds. So let's go over here at C12 in our little um, information pane about C12. And let's read here. NGC 6946, otherwise known as Caldwell 12, is a ninth magnitude face-on spiral galaxy that forms a nice pair with the nearby 7.8 magnitude open cluster. And you'll notice we didn't have to see this description first. We could already see that cluster in the frame. NGC 6939. Both can be observed together in the same low magnification field of view, and that's what we have. Our RASA is a wide field rather than a high magnification. It's a wide field. Separated by only two-thirds of a degree. NGC 6946, which is again C12, is a fine galaxy in a large telescope, but rather dull in small telescopes, which show this galaxy as a pale, undistinguished glow. So let me just pause for a second, and thank you, Lord, we're able to look at this through an 11-inch aperture telescope. This is showing us already these spiral arms. The beauty comes in the contrast form between the faint haze of NGC 6946 and the gran granular structure of the open cluster. Wow. So it's talking about this cluster. So let's let's try to get both of them in the frame here. Yes. Boy, they are right, aren't they? That is a a unique kind of a unique kind of view, isn't it? Where else could you go at 4.48 a.m. on a Tuesday morning and see this kind of thing? <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? Um, because NGC 6946 lies near the galactic plane, so that would be um, in our Milky Way galaxy, there's like a disk and then that glob in the middle. And when we look at objects through the disk line of sight, we're seeing a lot of stars, and I bet that's what it's gonna say. Photographs reveal a galaxy highly obscured by the matter from our own Milky Way. So we can only see this by the frame of reference that we have because we don't have Star Trek Enterprises yet. <laughs> so the only way we can look at it is from our vantage point. Here atop 216 meters <laughs> here uh, yeah, at Emerald Hills. But, uh, it says six supernovae have been detected in this galaxy more than in any other galaxy. So this galaxy is a, is a factory for exploding stars. The Hubble Space Telescope has identified a bright spot caused by the collision of two expanding supernova remnant shells. So uh, let's go over to um, the Hubble view and we'll go back to our Hubble index. And we're gonna go down to C12 and click on that. Okay, sure enough, oh boring. Once again, a breathtaking view from Hubble. <laughs> it is beautiful, isn't it? Wow, that is striking. Wow, when you just look at that and you think, that's like celestial fireworks. <laughs> look at that. It's like lit up. This thing is on fire. <laughs> all right a spectacular spot i'm going to make this a little bit bigger so we can see the whole thing while we read 
a spectacular spiral, octopus-like arms of stellar icy blue whipping around a glowing marmalade nucleus like water rushing toward a drain. Now see, why couldn't I have said that? <laughs> By contrast, on May 1st, I wrote, wow, saw the star-forming arms and also picked up the companion open cluster NGC 6939. Just doesn't compare to the opening sentence of the, of the Hubble description. On uh, September 10th, 2021, I wrote, this open cluster NGC 6939 was so much like Christmas but this fireworks galaxy is amazing. See, now that's not bad. I got to get a little more picturesque and talk about things like icy blue and glowing marmalade. Get a little more picturesque in my observations, don't I? Let's do a new log entry here and let's say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to copy this text. <laughs> I'm going to steal. <laughs> I'm going to steal. I'm going to put it here, but I'll put it in quotation marks. Don't worry. You know what? Sometimes this happens. I have to delete the first log entry and add a new one. There we go. Um, because the first log entry doesn't work for some reason sometimes in Starry Night Pro. I'm going to say here, credit the Hubble team for that picturesque. How do you spell picturesque? picturesque uh, description <laughs> of C27. Let's read that again. A spectacular spiral, colon. Octopus arms, no, octopus-like arms of stellar icy blue whipping around a glowing marmalade nucleus like water rushing down a drain. This is Caldwell 12 a mid-sized spiral galaxy that resides on the border of the constellations of Cephas and Cygnus in our night sky. Caldwell 12's beauty isn't its only claim to fame. An unprecedented 10 supernovae have been observed. Now you notice when our description in Starry Night Pro came out, I think it might have said six, but now that's been raised. Hubble has now discovered 10 supernovae in this galaxy. It's unprecedented. Have been observed in the galaxy's spiral arms since 1917, making it, well, it's not just Hubble, if it started in 1917, making it a popular object for both scientists and amateur astronomers alike. Unfortunately, its location, obscured behind lots of Milky Way dust, as well as its somewhat small size, about 50,000 light years across, so that would be about half the size of the Milky Way, our galaxy, don't do much to help its apparent luminosity at a magnitude of 9.7. This means it can particularly be, it can be particularly difficult to spot in the night sky and when found can often appear hazy rather than with stark well-defined spiral arms. So, I love the Hubble description. Thank you, NASA and the team at Hubble. Let's go back. Okay, so we've got uh, eight minutes on this now. Let's uh, zoom in on this galaxy for a second. Again, this is Caldwell 12. And we're beyond our camera's pixels, I know that, but I just kind of wanted to enjoy these arms. You know, I'll admit it is faint, but I hope against hope that you can see that. Let me bump up these mids a little bit more in hopes that that gives it a little bit more kick for you. That is not bad for a Tuesday morning at 4.54 a.m., Wow. Now, if you look really close, you can see the star forming regions. And of course, we have no idea which of these stars are in our Milky Way versus which ones of them that are part of the galaxy. But I have a hunch that along these arms, some of these stars we're seeing. Let me zoom in a little bit more again beyond our pixels. I know that, but see these little hazy stars. I bet those are part of the arms. Look at the way that star just looks like it's in the middle of a of an old-fashioned slingshot like David would have used against Goliath. And this galaxy is just whipping it out there. You know, I don't know about down a drain. Um, to me, it's more like a slingshot catapulting that stuff out. It's 
this is an amazing sight. I, I kind of feel sorry for Charles Messier that he didn't see this. You know, I'm going to save a snapshot of this with my screenshot just because this is a rather small target in a large frame. I'm just going to go ahead and save this and name it because it's so nice. I'm going to name it as um, C27. 10 minutes, 33 frames on 04, what are we, 19th? Um, that's just a really great shot. And let's go back to 100% and look at the whole frame again. You know, that's beautiful. At the camera's native pixel, Look how sharp that is. Now, you might have to get close up into your screen, you know, but that really is gorgeous from where I'm looking. I hope it is for you too. So we're going to save it exactly as seen. And before we leave, let's go back and take a look at this um, cluster again because that's beautiful in its own right. Going to have to shoot some more uh, darks I'm running darks, dark frame, uh, calibration frames. They, they uh, keep you from seeing uh, what's called hot pixels. And we are cooling the camera down to 8 degrees uh, below zero centigrade. It is a cooled camera, but still we've got a new hot pixel there. And a hot pixel is just one of the pixels in the camera's uh, millions or whatever of pixels. Uh, this camera is operating at what, 6,000? What is it? 6,248 by 4,176 pixels. And out of all those pixels, one of them is malfunctioning. But the trouble is, the way it works is uh, it amplifies that pixel and uh, makes it brighter because it thinks it's a star. Unless you shoot a calibration frame against a jet black uh, background so that the camera can say, oh, okay, these pixels are not to be enlarged. And then what it does essentially is it, in its memory, it turns off that one little tiny pixel. And uh, we've got another one there that's showing up. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a bright blue. Let me just zero in on that <laughs> pixel. It's a bright blue pixel. <laughs> and uh, notice what happens. Since the telescope is tracking with the night sky and this pixel's not, this pixel staying with the camera, it starts showing it as a little trail, sadly. So it does kind of muddy up the picture a bit, doesn't it? It takes away from the beauty of this galaxy. So I'll have to shoot new darks, and that, that'll free us of that, um, that bad pixel. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just look at this galaxy, just for, this cluster, just for a second. And this is in... NGC 6946. So let's do this very quickly, if you don't mind. Let's go to NGC 6946. It shows it as a... That's not right. 6939. Let's just do this by going down here. Yeah, there we go. And let's do a log entry for this too. Beautiful open cluster caught in the same frame as Caldwell 12. Um, the two together make for a beautiful duo. They really do, don't they? Well, that's fun. Back to our Caldwell working list. And back to our altitude sort, back to C12. We're going to say add to the observed list. And then over in live sky, we'll hmm, we'll why is it not letting me edit? Caldwell working list. C 
twelve. And oh, I need to edit. Twelve. Remove it from the working list. Save. Let's go back now to our um, full frame. One last time. Well, that's ugly because um, we've got that live histogram dialed up so high and uh, our telescope's not tuned that well. I'm gonna take one more shot of this. Now we're at 15 minutes. Save exactly a scene. What time is Astronomical Dawn at Emerald Hills? Simon asks. I think it's about 7.35ish this morning, something like that. Okay, we're gonna go sequencer and say next target. And back to our planetarium software, we're gonna go to the next target, which is Caldwell 37, and we'll center on that. And we'll also slew to it. There you go, careening through the night sky. So you can see the scope moving toward the east, settling down there. Wow, this is a particularly star-rich portion of the night sky. I don't know if you can see in our planetarium software. You know, I just think Starry Night Pro is beautiful. I mean, just look at that. Look at that view. You know, if it were a cloudy night, I would want to see this view. Look at those stars. It's so rich. And this is a particularly rich part of the night sky also, as you can see. We're near Vol Volpecula, aren't we? C27. Let's open up the information screen on C27. It is a spiral galaxy. And it's otherwise known as... Wait, that's, that's C12. We were just there. C37 open up the information on it, and it's an open cluster. Okay, so C37. Let's go over into sharp cap and put C37 here. And we gotta go to our title and say C37 here, which is otherwise known as NGC 6885, a, uh, an open cluster. And um, let's go back out to full frame. This is an APS-C camera. If you're familiar with imagers, um, you have different size sensors for these cameras, and this one is an APS-C, which is a pretty large size. <clears throat> APS-C used to be the top limit. Now you have full frame sensors, which we don't have. But um, the Rasa 11 <clears throat> does experience a little bit of fall off at the corners of a full frame camera anyway. And uh, Light frames can hide that light fall off. And we are running um, uh, light frames, you know, we're, we're running those to allow us, you know, you can see our flats here that we are running in sharp cap. And flat frames are a different kind of calibration frame that let you compensate for uh, changes in the light patterns. Uh, whereas dark frames compensate for things like hot pixels. Uh, flat frames compensate for like, for example, fall off of light and light patterns on a white screen. Uh, so we are running flats, but what we got to realize is that as the light falls off, so does the detail fall off on a full frame camera. So I think with the Ross 11, a full frame camera is a bit of a, a bit of a misuse of its uh, time, you know, because it, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, uh, detail out there in those corners anyway. So to me, a 
APS-C camera is a good fit for Rasa 11. So we didn't do a um, a uh, a plate solve here, did we? But I trust that this must be the this must be the um, the cluster up here. And let's go back over our planetarium software. And it is. Look how you've got this bright star here, 20 Volpecula, right in the middle of the cluster. And then you got these three stars in a row up here. So see, um, here's that bright star, and here are these three stars. You notice a little bit of rotation in the view that our scope has. Right now, it's pretty much straight up. So I could, could I? I could, when I mount the camera, but I... I don't want to mess with it, but I could spin the camera a little bit and get rid of a little bit of that rotation. Look how in this view, oh, let me get back over here. See how it's twisted a little bit more to the right than it is on the left real side. This is the actual real-time view, and these these three stars and that 20 volt pecula line up in the straight line almost. Whereas over here on the right-hand side in the planetarium software, they're canted at about what would you say? Is that 20 degrees to the right? So I could spin the camera about 20 degrees, but it doesn't matter to me because when the camera turns over on its side to go peer east, uh, the whole telescope rather turns over on its side, or when it turns over on its other side to go peer west, you can see how it it does that sometimes in this view. It'll It'll pitch to one side or the other depending on the target these rotations get messed up anyway. So I've just learned to live with it. But people always say, well, look, it doesn't match. It doesn't match. Well, it never matches exactly to me unless you have a field rotator on there. And uh, you can't do that with a with a Rasa telescope. There's not enough space for it. This is a nice little cluster, a little open cluster. I know that some people, they don't enjoy open clusters as much as other things. I kind of always do. I think they look like, you know, Christmas lights or something. I think that's beautiful. Anyway, I looked at this on September 10th and said, we saw 19 Volpecula as a super yellow and 20 Volpecula as the center. Beautiful open cluster object. Where is 19? Hmm. Oh, there it is. So 19 is out here. It's the middle star. Okay, I get it now. Look, there's the middle star, and it's yellow. And that's 19 Volpecula. And look, here is 20 Volpecula. And you can see a stark contrast in their color, can't you? So that is true. It's beautiful. All right, so another log entry. And uh, <clears throat> let's just say beautiful. There it goes. It won't let me enter that log entry. It's like it locks up or something. And so I've reported this. And by the way, last night I actually wrote simulation curriculum again. I said, so with deep respect, and I said, and I do mean deep respect because I love this program. Do you know when this might be corrected? Uh, I'm going to say uh, we loved the color. Oh, there it goes again. <laughs> it's a glitch. Uh, but, you know, you put up with it because of all the other positive sides. We loved the uh, color differences between 19 and 20 Volpecula. Looked like Christmas lights on this crisp uh, 34 degree morning. Okay, let's save this exactly as seen. And um, let's run our sequencer for next target. Let's go back over to C37. 
And let's say add to the observing list, observed, go back to live sky, and we're going to go back to edit mode and search for 37 again. We're going to remove it from the working list because we've already seen it now. Save that list. And look at the next target, which is C20. And so we'll center on C20. Let's see where it is in the night sky first before we go marching off somewhere else. And, um, oh my goodness, look at this target. That's beautiful. Okay, so we're still hovering around Cygnus the Swan. If Cygnus were a flying swan, it would be looking at its left eyeball to look at this. Let's look at all the constellations for a second. So you can see where we are in the night sky. And by the way, this is a photorealistic picture of our horizon. So there's Pegasus just coming up over the northeastern horizon. Here's the North Star and Little Dipper. So if you look at the Little Dipper out the back side of the Dipper, and underneath this little parallelogram of Lyra, just to the left of this swan, Cygnus, you'll find C20 in the night sky. So let's... Man, that is beautiful target. Look how with our Rasa we can get quite a lot of that. Not this part up here, but quite a lot of this part. Um, let's go over to sharp cap and let's do a plate soft to make sure that we're looking at the right part because this will be critical to get as much of this thing in the frame as we can. That's a huge target. Huge. Mongo. Um, let's pull up our information screen on this. And We'll go to, looks like it was a half a degree off, which would have made a difference. C20 is the target name. C20, otherwise known as NGC 7000. I recognize that number. Um, this is the North America Nebula. The North America Nebula. A diffuse nebula. Okay, see how when our um, when we plate solve, and our camera has to move in order to match what was the correct place. Um, there's a little bit of star movement that happens, and so there you see that star movement. Quite a lot of star movement there, isn't there? Hmm. Okay, there it appears to have settled down. Man, I'm not seeing any nebula in that picture, are you? This must be a very dim nebula. Okay, we'll start live stacking. So let's keep in mind, if you are looking through a telescope, this view on the left here, this is a live view. Keep in mind the view on the right, that is the planetarium software. But the view on the left is a live view. This is what you might see through your telescope if you were just doing visual observing with an eyepiece. So you see why I'm a big fan of electronically assisted astronomy. If we were looking through an eyepiece, we might not see very much. With the moon at 91%, with the light pollution here in Louisville, and with basically just this night sky and this dim, faint object, we wouldn't see very much, sadly. But let's see if we can pull out a little bit of this anyway. Uh, let's go to Start Imaging. And we'll do, of course, longer exposures. Now, this is a, a luxury that our human eye doesn't have. You see, our human eye is always seeing, obviously. You're going to say, well, duh. Our human eye is always seeing a real-time view. And 
our brain has the capacity to remember each kind of frame of what our eyes are seeing for maybe what, a 30th of a second? That's kind of what we remember. We remember the equivalent of a 30th of a second. And then we're on to the next frame and we see life through this movie of 1 30th of a second shots of life. Well, we were looking at three second time exposures and we still weren't seeing anything a while ago. So you see, looking through a telescope with just our normal eye, at least through an 11 inch telescope, we wouldn't see anything, sadly. Because of the nature of our eye in a real time view. But what live stacking does, it takes that first exposure and with live stacking, we can also use time exposure. So we take a 20 second time exposure. Instead of a 30th of a second, we take a 20th of a second, I mean 20 seconds time exposure. And then we add the next 20th, the next 20 second time exposure as a layer on top. Now it's not really adding because if you just kept adding them on top, then eventually even if you aligned the stars, which is what SharpCap is smart enough to do, you'd get all of the dirtiness of all of those frames. And each frame has a certain amount of dirtiness. And we call that dirtiness noise. And it's caused by a lot of things. It's caused by atmospheric disturbance and light pollution and moonlight and everything else, uh, together with the camera's abnormalities. And it's just grainy sort of like sandy looking stuff in the picture that's not a part of the night sky it's a it's an aberration of our viewing so uh, what sharp cap magically does thank you dr robert robin glover uh, the designer of sharp cap what sharp cap does is it averages kind of you could use the word average it averages those 20 second views and the things in the screen that are kind of like brighter it um, it makes those even brighter. And the things that are darker, it drops them out, completely loses them. So the graininess and the noise start fading with enough time. And the, the faint pictures eventually begin to um, come through if we wait long enough with live stacking. So let's go over here on uh, September the 10th. This looked in sharp cap like one of the most astounding captures to date. This must be incredibly bright and brought across the frame. I don't know how long I looked at it, but I don't think it's bright. That was September 10th, May 1st. Remarkable, I wrote. Sometimes I write remarkable because I'm not really seeing a whole lot. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, so we're gonna start a new log entry here and let's just say at three seconds, we weren't seeing anything at all. At 20 seconds, we still couldn't see anything. In fact, I'm still not seeing anything. Are we looking at the right thing? Did we slew our telescope? <laughs> Doug, you're a nitwit. This is still that open cluster. No wonder we're not seeing anything. Sorry, that's just a mistake. Let's Go to the next target and let's slew the telescope to C20. <laughs> you're sitting there and you're thinking, ah, Doug, that's still the open cluster. Oh boy, I need a drink. I need a drink. Okay. All right, now let's do a plate solve. But then we noticed we were still viewing C37, the last target. Ha ha, slewed. <laughs> we were uh, 1,500ths of a degree off. 
But let the record show, I still don't see any North American nebula there. But at least now the stars are looking kind of like the stars that we should be seeing in the frame, at least. Okay, now let's start live stacking. So it switches the exposure to 20 seconds. Oh, Simon says, we forgive you, dog. Have a coffee and wake up. <laughs> wake up! <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I really do feel wet, rested. I slept like six hours, you know. I went to bed early so I could get up at three. Uh, let's close that. And uh, what it's doing now is it, it's capturing that first frame, and bam, uh, there we are. So now we're seeing nebulosity. So at once we got into the right frame of the sky, we immediately could see, what is that? Is that trying to think of what part of the North America continent that is? <laughs> Would that be Florida? Yeah, I think that's Florida. <laughs> Florida. after just 20 seconds. Um, here in the planetarium software, you kind of have to realize, you sort of have to turn your head, you kind of have to turn it like this in order to see this as North America, don't you? And then when you do, it's backwards. But to be fair, that's because we do have it flipped. Um, look up here under options. Oh, no, we don't. Huh. We have sharp cap flipped. That's right. So how do people get North America out of this? That doesn't make sense. Somebody help me out. Why does that look like North America? Maybe that's not Florida. We need help with this. Let's go up here and say NGC 7000 wiki. Well, that's exactly what we're seeing. Would somebody help me out? Oh, oh, I see. That's like uh, maybe Maine? And these are the Great Lakes? I think somebody was drunk when they thought this was North America. <laughs> it doesn't look like North America to me. Let's uh, go back here and go to images. I know one of you all are gonna, one of you all gonna tell me, Doug, Doug, you're just not seeing it. But you're right, I'm not seeing it. What part is Florida? Well, I don't think we should lose any sleep over this. This is just some, this is some <coughs> communist plot to make us think that our country looks like that. <laughs> C20. Let's see what Hubble saw. Hubble won't lie to us. Hubble. Hubble's going to zero in on this. That's not C20. That's C18. C20. Come to me, Hubble. Come to me, Hubble Index. C20. Look, that says C18. You know what? They have a problem. They, they have a problem with their tagging. So what we're going to do is we're going to say Hubble C20 and go straight to this because their index is messed up. We should report it. Yeah, a very small portion. But look here, 
they show what they zeroed in on. The Hubble frame is like looking through life through a straw because it's so high res. While the spiral feature in the upper portion of this Hubble image may resemble the arm of a galaxy or the heart of a cosmic storm, it is actually a small portion of Caldwell 20 NGC 7000 or North American Nebula, discovered by William Herschel in 1786 and nicknamed for its resemblance to the continent of North America. No. Caldwell 20 is located roughly 1,800 light years from Earth and occupies a space in the constellation Cygnus that appears more than three times larger than the full moon. However, despite its apparent magnitude of five, the nebula does not appear very bright against the starry Milky Way. Binoculars or a small telescope will reveal it as a subtle brightening against its galactic backdrop. Observers in the northern hemisphere should look for Caldwell 20 in the autumn, and we're not, but we came in the spring at 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and Southern Hemisphere observers will have their best view in the spring. We're with you guys down in Australia today. How about that? It's a stunning example of an emission nebula. The clouds of gas that make up the nebula are being ionized by a nearby star, causing the gas to glow as it emits energy, like a neon light, in other words. Colors emitted by emission nebula depend on the chemical composition of the region. The reddish color that is characteristic of hydrogen and dominates Caldwell 20 can be picked up by sensitive cameras. Okay, so let's go back over and... Um, Let's kick up our, let's zero into this part. Cause that's gonna be our best bet. Yes. That is really cool. Let's kick up those mids a little more. You know what always astounds me, gang? Oh, somebody's helping me. It is the long trunk Mexico, then the Gulf. Oh, is the long trunk. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us, Peter. Is the long trunk Mexico, then the Gulf, and then Florida. So let's go back over here. Is the long trunk Mexico, and then the Gulf, Florida. Ah. I see. So you're saying this is Mexico and and this is Florida. By Jove, I think you're right, Peter. I think you've got it. So this would be the eastern seaboard of North America. And up here would be Canada. And then we come across here. We come down the West Coast. And this is California. And we go down to Mexico. You know, Peter, you just educated me. I think you've got it. From now on, I'll know. And I'm going to write here my observation with Peter's help. We finally saw quote, saw North America in the nebula. Man, I bet you do great on ink blot tests, Peter. Wow, look at that. Now that's seven minutes, to be fair. I would say that's alive. That is, look how magenta this is almost. Now, this little enclave here, must be that enclave there. Yeah, look at this little pattern here. This looks like a dark nebula. See that little, let's zoom in on that. Look at the way this gas presumably, is keeping us from seeing the red emission nebula behind it. And that pattern is right here in our planetarium software. See that pattern there? 
Now this dark nebula is not cataloged in Starry Night Pro, but somewhere, somewhere, I bet somebody's cataloged that dark nebula. Just gonna say center on that star for a second so we can keep it from moving. And look at this. You know what amazes me? Here's what I was gonna say a while ago. What amazes me is that that dark nebula has been there for all these years. And I don't know if you thought about the night sky. If you're a beginner in astronomy, maybe this is just dawning on you like it dawns on me constantly. This image is like tacked. It's like stuck. It's pegged to the night sky in the same spot every night. And by the same spot, I'm of course meaning relatively speaking with all the stars. And as the earth rotates on its axis, the stars appear to glide path, you know, above, like the Christmas song says, the stars gliding by. But this dark nebula, in relation to the stars, it always looks exactly, it's in exactly the same place. And over our entire lives, there will be very little movement in this dark nebula. But out there, at whatever number of light years this is away, how far are we from this object? Did it say... Um, hmm. Did the Hubble description say? Hmm. That was the picture here. Eighteen hundred. So this, this is actually the view that we would see. Let's get back to our live view. The view on the left here, this is a live view right now, but that would be the way it would, would be, the way it would have happened 1800 years ago. Because that's when this light was emitted and that's when this little dragon or maybe it looks like a deer Okay, I'm going to take my turn of naming something that's upside down. See how it might look like a deer that's pushing its head out to eat the grass across the fence? That dark nebula emitted this image 1,800 years ago, and the light has been traveling toward us for 1,800 years. 1,800 years, and this is 2,200. So 400 B.C., no, 400 A.D., this light began traveling toward us. And it has been traveling toward us all this time. I think that's remarkable. And it's stuck in the night sky right there. And it's always up there. And it was there last night when you went to bed. And it was just waiting to be discovered like some little Easter egg. It's a beautiful nebula. Okay, we're going to um, head to the next target. And uh, that would be, that was C20. So we're going to add that to the observed. And over in Live Sky, we're going we're gonna to search for C20 and remove it and then save it. And the next one is C34. It's at 52 degrees right now. And let's uh, center it and let's uh, salute to it before we forget. And maybe don't salute things like I did last time. <laughs> we didn't move very much, did we? Oh, this does look like the Veil Nebula, isn't it? C-34. The Western Veil. NGC 6960. Wow. You know, I wonder if we... Look how there's some more nebulosity over here. Look how our scope 
is kind of giving precedence to this part of the veil, but then we're not seeing that last wisp of smoke. Can we move this? How would we do that? Would I, what if we find a star? So much of this is a, well, let's just do this. Let's position it like this, like we want it. And then let's say, Isn't there a thing that says, in Star Night Pro, isn't there a thing that says, slew to gaze? That's what we want. So we're going we're gonna to position this the way we want it. Oh, boy. Um, hand. We're going to position this the way we want it. And then we're going to say, slew to gaze. So that makes the telescope go exactly what we're looking for, supposedly. And it did. It, You saw the crosshairs just moved. Oh, no, you didn't. You're not on that screen. Sorry. <laughs> what I'm doing is lining up the entire thing. So the whole deal should hopefully, Lord willing, be in our, in our field of view. Okay, so let's close this. Slew to gaze. I wonder if there's a keyboard shortcut to that because that's a pretty handy command. We'll have to remember that. Slew to gaze. Now let's uh, plate solve so it'll be exactly where our gaze is pointing. This is C34. So let's put up here in this title in sharp cap. C34, and what that does is just <clears throat> make sure it's named correctly. We were 15 hundredths of a degree off, so it's correcting that. And while that's settling, let's go down and do our title. C34 is NGC 6960, the Western Veil. Um, this would be a diffuse nebula again. These are some of the greatest images of the night sky, some of the most spectacular. Look, there's C34. I'm sorry. The, see that bright star there? What, what, what star is that? Select other. 52 Cygni. So that's 52 Cygni, and this is 52 Cygni right here. So let's start stacking. And 52 Cygni, by the way, is a double star. Did you see the way for a split second when you open up live stacking? Did you see the way it remembered the image of the North American Nebula? And the reason is because this live stacking image is kind of... Um, stored in, you, you kind of think of it like stored in the RAM of the computer. It's not being saved to disk. And so when we started the live stacking image, look, you can already see the veil. Look at that. Wow. Uh, when we started live stacking, it still had the last image in its RAM. And uh, boy, our alignment didn't line up exactly correctly, did it? There's that wisp right here. Um, so we're looking at about right like that. And let's do a new color balance just since this is a different bird. And let's 
Look how you can make the sky bright, and that does brighten the object. If you put the blocks on the left side of the peak, but it also makes it ugly, doesn't it? I mean, it's just plain ugly. So I kind of like a blacker sky. This is really it's a very personal thing as to how you arrange these histogram bars. And I think everybody does this a little bit differently. But I, I like the sky to be pretty dark. <clears throat> you can hold down the shift key and it gives you a little more fine tuning control over these. For my taste, I like it to be about like that. Uh, are these, this yellow line here, Are th is that the blacks? Boy. This is a very faint nebula, isn't it? Trying to make that thing pop there. It almost looks like a um, I don't know, it looks like a... I've, a veil, it looks like a veil that's kind of been blown away from the wedding. Like the bride set it down on the table where the cake was and the wind picked it up. Now, look, we're starting to see some of this nebulosity here, but uh, Sadly, I think some of the aberration that's built into my scope, because I don't have it quite properly tuned yet, I'm really looking forward to getting out on a warmer night and standing out there by the scope for six hours and hand tuning this Rasa. I got it to within about, what, 23% proper back focus and I quit just because I was wanting to get to observing. But Man, it's showing on this target because we're having to crank up the mid so much. You can see the way that my improper back focus is creating this huge, like a giant donut shaped light pattern. And, you know, I'm running the flats, but it, that, those flats are not strong enough to take out that 23% improper back focus the the aberration you get from that so I'll get out there first warm night and I'll stand out there by that new monitor <laughs> and it'll be a little more fun now because we have a large monitor I'll probably do part of it as a live stream <laughs> and I'll tune up this uh, back focus so we we don't have this light problem but I'm just trying to coax find a way to coax see if we crank up these if we move the blacks all the way over there, it does accentuate the veil pattern, doesn't it? But it does so at the expense. If we bring it over here and make the night sky black, the veil disappears. And then if we crank up the mids too much, we start getting that aberration again. This is a faint target. Now let's zero in a little bit more right here. So it looks sort of like a very streamlined stork flying in the night sky. That's five minutes. Let's look at our last observations here. C34, yeah. We fortunately benefited from a friend named Frank who encouraged us to frame the entire veil in the view and it worked while western, central, and eastern veil in one frame. In spite of a full moon and Bortle 6, this F2 scope saw the western veil amazing in five minutes flat. So that's kind of what we're seeing. Wispy smoke. Is 
says and supernova remnant huh um i have to read about that in a second okay so let's do a new log entry and let's say in the um, 5.45 a.m. of this crisp spring morning at 35 degrees, 32 degrees, it's actually 33 degrees, 33 degrees, we had just a little difficulty coaxing the veil out from the from whatever causes that donut of color aberration in our Rasa 11. Can't wait to um, adjust back focus some more. Still, we could make it out among the red tinted sky. Looked like a bride's veil that blew away from the wedding cake table. Or like a streamlined stork flying across the night sky. Whatever you think about that. There it is in the planetarium software. This is beautiful. Some star there, isn't it? It's beautiful. Oh yeah. So see at eight minutes we're getting a lot more detail. So part of this is just to get, have to be patient, give it some time. I don't know that we got our framing right though. I think part of it was because the camera is spun a little bit incorrectly. But look, we're starting to pick up a little bit of this. Um, see that structure there? And I think that's called the, is that the Eastern Veil? Let's look at our telescope and see which way are we pitched. No, we're still straight up. I think this is the Western Veil. And I think that, or maybe I've got these backward. Maybe that's the Eastern Veil and this is the Western Veil. Let's see if Caldwell helps us out with this. I mean, Hubble. Um, this is C34. C34. Wow, look at that structure. The Veil Nebula is one of the most spectacular supernova remnants. So that's why it's a supernova remnant in the night sky, extending 110 light years across and covering an area six times larger than the full moon. The western section of the veil is Caldwell 34 or 6960. Um, while the eastern is Caldwell 33. I see. The remains of a star once 20 times as massive as the sun that exploded several thousand years ago. The Veil Nebula lies about 2,000 light years away in the Constitution Cygnus. It's often referred to as the Cygnus Loop because of its arced shapes. Oh, that's interesting. The Cygnus Loop. The Hubble image displays a section of C-34, also known as the Witch's Broom. I see. So maybe this entire thing is C-34. Ah, look. I bet this is the other part of the Veil. NGC 6995. Let's open up. Select other. 
Oh no, did it just slew there? I hope not. <laughs> uh, show info, Eastern Vale. Yeah, so this is the Western Vale. Um, I hope that it didn't just slew over there, but it looks like it did. I better save this as seen. Because if that's slew, then that's going to mess up our image. Yeah. Anyway, this is the Western Veil, and that's the Eastern Veil. And this whole thing is a Cygnus loop. And this structure is just part of the Western Veil. Getting an education here today. The Witch's Broom. I could see that. Couldn't you see how this is like a witch's broom? Roughly two light years across, covering only a tiny fraction of the nebula structure. It's a mosaic of six Hubble pictures taken with a wide field camera on April 3rd of um, 2015. The fast moving blast wave from the supernova explosion is plowing into a wall of cool, denser interstellar gas, emitting a light and forcing twisting tendrils of gas into a frenetic ballet. Who writes this stuff? Um, the nebula lies along the edge of a large bubble of low density gas that was blown into space by the dying star prior to its self detonation. This image shows an incredible array of structure and detail from the collision between the blast wave and the gas and dust to make up the cavity wall. The nebula resembles a crumpled bed sheet viewed from its side. Now that is a good description. A crumpled bed sheet viewed from the side. The bright regions are where the shock wave is encountering relatively dense material or where the bed sheet ripples are viewed edge on. By comparing these 2015 observations to images taken by Hubble in 1997, whoa, Astronomers can study how the nebula has expanded in the intervening 18 years. And by studying the nebula's structure, scientists will learn more about how the formation of the nebula's tendrils have been influenced by the density variations in the expelled stellar material as well as the space around it. Imagine that. We can compare the change over 18 years if we've got the Hubble. And we can look through this soda straw of how uh, strongly it is uh, magnified. Astronomer William Herschel identified the Veil Nebula in 1784. His work was followed up by Wilhelmina Fleming's 1904 discovery of a fainter portion of the nebula, referred to as Pickering's Triangle, after the director of the Harvard College Observatory, where Fleming worked. How about that? So this must be Pickering's Triangle. This, on this left side. Get back up here. So this is Pickering's Triangle, and this is the Witch's Broom, and all of this is the Western Veil. Very interesting. Okay. Um, let's, and the reason it's not stacking is because we accidentally slewed over the Easter Veil. <laughs> I was afraid of that. So let's go to our next target. And then let's, because this is where the telescope's pointing. See how it tells us where the telescope is looking? <laughs> I hit slew instead of center a while ago. Select other, uh, center. So we'll just slew once and for all over to NGC 6995. Oh, before I forget, we need to take uh, C34 and say add to the observe list. And over here in uh, Live Sky, we need to search for 34 and delete 34 and save it. And then this is 6995. 
which it said was Caldwell 33, right? Yeah, Caldwell 33. So we'll close this and we'll open Caldwell 33, which is the Eastern Vale. I don't know why these are backward. I guess because the guess because I don't know I guess because the image is flipped in the in the I don't know so that's Western Vale on the right and this is the Eastern Vale on the left it should be the other oh I see why because we're looking up in the sky at night and so the things that are on the left are toward the east in the sky. So it's not like looking at a terrestrial map where things on the right are to the east. That's right. Okay, so we're looking up in the sky. Things that are on the left are toward the east. So this is the Eastern Vale, 6995. And let's go here and put here C33. And we'll start did we plate solve? I can't remember if we plate solved. I guess we could look up here in the tools and say um, deep sky image and annotation. So that's where the Eastern Vale is going to be. So I don't think we've plate solved yet. So let's plate solve. Well, that's place solving. We're going to go down the title and say C33, which is NGC 6995, the Eastern Veil. Vale. Oh, we must have played solved. Just one one hundredth of a degree off. Um, and this is um, a diffuse. Nebula. Okay, we're synced, we're titled, are we settled? There we go. And let's start imaging. Boy, you sure can't see it without time exposures, can you? It's just not possible. We need aperture and time and stacks of frames. You know, stacks of frames give us more time as well. Yeah, look at that. At 20 seconds, we could already see that. Boy, that's a mess of color, isn't it? Let's color balance, white balance, whatever you want to call that. And let's get our mids back over here and our blacks here on this crest, a little bit to the right of the crest. Now let's pull our mids back until we can start to see that color. Yeah, look at that. Wow, that's after just 40 seconds. This is beautiful. So this is the Eastern Veil. Vale. And on June 15th last year, we said beautiful crescent shape. Um, Faint but beautiful, same night. I was drunk. Just kidding, I wasn't drunk. Uh, July 21st last year, I wrote very faint. I think we're going to see a little better here. We could make out the um, faint structures after just 20 seconds of integration. This, the Eastern Veil is a great complement to C34, the Western Veil. This is also huge. Uh, this is at 29%. This is 
a big structure. Really does look like a crescent shape, doesn't it? You look over here at the um, planetarium software. Look how there's a another echo or something of slight nebulosity up here, and then there's this beautiful look at that. That's just gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Look at all this structure down here. We're not seeing much of that yet. Just maybe starting to pick it up here. If we make the sky just a little bit darker, then it almost gives it more contrast against the night sky, doesn't it? Again, you can see why Sir Patrick Caldwell Moore had a heart for these objects, which were omitted from Messier's list. I know we've shared this before, so if, if you've heard this before, forgive me, but Charles Messier in uh, the 1700s, the mid-1700s, and his colleagues, uh, they were looking for comets. They were just comet crazy. So they were concerned about things in our own solar system. And when they would see objects that reminded them of comets, it would distract them. And they'd start looking at it. Are you a comet? Are you a comet? Are you a comet? And they'd spend several minutes looking at it and realize, oh my goodness, I've seen that before. Why do I keep seeing that? And then what they would do is they'd catalog that so they could remember, don't confuse that in the future. It was like an annoyance. And this list of things that annoyed him has become the most, the most well-known list of deep sky objects in the world, the Messier list. Well, along about 19, the mid-1990s, an amateur astronomer in UK named Sir Patrick Moore had a compound last name, Caldwell Moore, but he typically was known as Sir Patrick Moore. He, he said, oh my goodness, if a person has a telescope and they're ready for a little bit better challenge, there are some beautiful objects that Messier missed. And he said, these should be collected. And in one night, handwritten, he made a list of these objects. And when he made his list, he made them in order by uh, north to south. And he also included a lot of objects that are in the southern hemisphere that Messier missed because he was observing in the northern hemisphere. So finally, our Australian brothers and sisters and our New Zealand brothers and sisters and our South American and the Southern Cone of Africa brothers and sisters, they have some objects that are special in their sky, just like Messier observed in the Northern Hemisphere. Kind of gives them equal time. <laughs> and so now we finally get these huge objects that were in the Southern sky that Messier missed, like the large and the small Magellanic cloud that we don't ever get to see. They have all their equivalents to the Orion Nebula versions over in the south part of the sky that are beautiful for them. And also Sir Patrick Caldwell Moore included those in his list. So what we're looking at here is something that obviously should have been included in Messier's list if he really wanted to find the most spectacular night sky images. But he didn't, you know, because uh, he was using a three and a half inch telescope for one thing. And these objects are a little more challenging, but once viewed through a telescope, they're very beautiful, aren't they? Look at all this superstructure now. Look up in here, the hints, in just six minutes, look at the hints of superstructure we're picking up here, which are these, over on the right-hand side in the planetarium software, they're these hints. And we're starting to see those after just six minutes of stacking time exposures, just six minutes. As we stack, 
our color balance changes, I think in part, because it's picking up the color of this huge object. <laughs> and it's trying to figure out what color do I need to do here? <laughs> so it's trying to make sense out of all these colors that it's seeing. Wow, that's gorgeous. All right, we'll save that as seen. Back out to a full image of it. Back off a little bit of the mids. And that's the Eastern Veil. Beautiful. All right, so we go to C33 and we say, Um, add to the observed list. And then we go here and we search for C33 here. We remove it. Save it. And let's do another stack for altitude in case things have changed. And they haven't. Let's go to C19. It's at 50 degrees. These are really high in the sky. This is nice. So let's center on C19. Let's slew to C19. Quite a bit of light pollution in that view, huh? Hmm. Let's let's go over that in real time. Let's back off on that a little bit. It's 800 millisecond screens. Uh, let's make it 600 milli or 700 milliseconds, maybe. Maybe 600 milliseconds. I wonder if we're starting to get a little bit of morning dawn light. Maybe. But this uh, white light here, yeah, that might be a little bit of morning dawn because there's the building over off to the right. This is looking northeast. Look at the clouds and the morning, the morning dawn starting to appear. We're down to 500 milliseconds. Yeah. That's wild. Okay, so let's do um, start imaging here. Let's go down here in our title, change this to C19. And let's open up. is another diffuse nebula, Cocoon. This is the Cocoon Nebula. C19 is also known as IC5146. So this doesn't have an NGC number, does it? No, it doesn't have an NGC number. This is called the Cocoon Nebula. Wonder why this doesn't? Maybe you think it's it's a diffuse nebula. Wonder why it doesn't have an NGC number. Let's do a color balance. Move our mids over. I think we're having to color balance now because the dawn, the morning sky is kind of chasing chasing us a little bit. 60 seconds. Cocoon Nebula. C19 is a diffuse nebula. That's all it basically says. The rest of this is standard. Let's go out to our and 
And let's search for C19 or otherwise known as IC5146. IC5146. It's a reflection, emission, nebula, and Caldwell object cluster. IC5146 is a cluster of 9.5 magnitude stars involved in a bright and a dark nebula. Ah, so the actual IC number is the cluster number, also known as Colander 470. It's a magnitude plus 10, so that's kind of dim. Wouldn't be naked eye. I mean, you could see this in binoculars perhaps, but the star Pi Cygni, the open cluster NGC 7209 is nearby. There's 7209. Well, why can't I get my... There we go. Here's 7209, the open cluster here. Ah, I see. Look at that. You had to zoom in quite a bit. So there's there's an open cluster, 5146. And that open cluster is illuminating this diffuse nebula. And there's that star, Tycho, whatever it is, that star, Pi Cygni. which in Starry Night Pro is called Tycho 3608-14461. <laughs> this is rather small. I wonder if it tells us the angular size. Well, not too bad, 12 arc minutes. Just looked like a little dot, didn't it? You can see why they called it Cocoon Nebula, because it does look like a little cocoon. Round one though. Quite a bit going on there. Let's go over and see if we can spot this yet. I'll do another color balance. Pull these darks over. And pull in these mids. Boy, I am not seeing it, are you? Huh. I think this star, and look at these two, and they give way to a third, that's right here. There's that star, these two, these two, and give way to a third pair. So I guess this star and this star. So this is our this is our central star. Boy, look at that brightening up. Yeah, there's the dawn. How about that? <laughs> so we might not be able to pick this up because it's being lost in the dawn light. We're having to constantly adjust our color. Oh, there it is. See up here? Boy, we would never have picked this out if we were using visual observing. But with EAA, we can see it now. See right up here. I don't know if you're noticing it, but it's if you're able to see it on the YouTube stream, but it, that nebulosity is right up there. Th 
that diffuse nebula. Looks like we had a little satellite trail, just barely caught a satellite trail here. That's at just six minutes. But look how with every single frame that it catches, we're now starting to get this sky. Remember how we had this tuned a while ago? Uh, we had it tuned almost down to darkness. And with every single image now, the dawn is coming. The dawn is chasing us. Um, Corin Lewis, nice to have you here from London, 1108 there. Welcome, Corin. Glad you're here. I'm going to look in our um, <clears throat> clear outside and look and see what it says for the dawn. It says we start losing the darkest part of the night around 5.15 and around 5.30, when it's 6.16, at 5.30 we lose astronomical darkness and sunrise begins at 6.15 and it is exactly 6.15. <laughs> so we could have been the weather people today, huh? <laughs> we, were, we were seeing sunrise before our very eyes with every single every single 20 second frame becomes that much brighter that's crazy isn't it so i'm going to try to scale these blacks and kick up our mids but we are losing this object in the in the morning sky but it is right there i can Barely make it out, but it is not our best image of the cocoon. <laughs> There's another picture of of sunrise. Oh my goodness, look at that. Look at that sunrise. So there you have it. Um, let me do a um, a log entry here that says we oh, it's like our little glitch again. So we're going to delete that one and start again. We had just begun seeing this object in the faint darkness when each new frame became brighter and brighter with sunrise. How about that? Not our best view of the Cocoon Nebula. That's funny. Well, I gotta say, this is a new experience for me. I guess that just shows I'm a, I'm still a fairly new observer. I've been doing this for, I guess, a year and a half now, but I've never gotten up early and watched sunrise come in in sharp cap while trying to view an object in the east. There is so much sunlight that it is obscuring our view of this cocoon nebula. Oh, there it is. You see it again up here? Boy, every single frame that comes in just obscures it even more. But I can see it right here. It's a very faint red glow right here in the, in the morning light. So I'm not going to save that image. It's not a particularly great image of the cocoon nebula, but we did at least see it. You know, it would be interesting. I wonder if we back off of this. In our planetarium software, let's go ahead and close out that stacking because I think we've seen about all we're going to see. Look at that bright sky now. In our planetarium software, I'm curious if we search for, in our planetarium software, search for the sun, show info, it rises at seven. So what this tells us is a full 40 minutes before sunrise, we start losing the ability to see the night sky. I would say even at 45 minutes. So let's, let's kind of remember that. 
lights are coming on for you and they are going out for me. <laughs> Simon says, that's, that's great, Simon. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Simon, I'm trying to remember where you are. Are you in Colorado? I don't think you've said yet. Or are you down in Australia, Simon? Maybe you're down in Australia. Anyway, um, we can't see the sun yet with our horizon here, but let's do this. Let's go up under options and say, I'm sorry, view and say, hide the horizon. And there's the sun. So we can kind of get a visual image of where it is in relation to the horizon. And we were up here viewing C19. And look how much the sun is already flooding the night sky. Let's do this. Let's look over in the direction of the west. And so now we've panned over in our planetarium software. And let's, by the way, I should go back to the east again and show you where the sun was because I think I had the wrong view. I was, I was showing you the night sky. <laughs> but this is a planetarium software view of the sun. Look at the sun underneath the horizon. So while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and put the horizon back just, just so we can see it there. And now let's go over to the western part of the sky. You'll see it kind of pan past the south meridian and then we're looking in the west and let's see if we can pick out something in the west what is ngc 4530 oh it's a a double star mistake mistaken for a deep sky object <laughs> Um, I wonder if we could find, well, I know something we'll still be able to see easily, huh? Boy, look at that brightness now out in the observatory. It just looks like daylight out there, doesn't it? I think that's because we've got that camera on, on, um, you know, night mode. There's no uh, infrared on that camera, but it does allow you to adjust for the darkness. And that's a beautiful view of the counterweights over there to the left. You can see the counterweights and then see the telescope now peer east and that's why I say it really does no good to align the camera to the frame because it always gets mixed up anyway. So the telescope is leaning way back now peer east to see this object way off in the southwest. And let's see if we can, oh my goodness, that's the sky. We're losing our night sky. <laughs> let's let's just put moon here and let's change this to about a 500 millisecond camera view at at maybe an AS an IS a gain of 100 there we go. And let's back off a little bit. And let's make it um, 80 milliseconds. My goodness. Let's make it um, one millisecond. There we go. <laughs> There's the moon. So 
It really is a big target, isn't it? So we can still see the moon at least. Uh, now let's go over to SharpCap, uh, to Planetarium software, and uh, let's uh, let's zoom in on the moon over here. And in our last five minutes, Labels. Let's say, um, look at all these choices. If you right click the moon, it's just got so many special choices. Markers and outlines, for example. And what we can do is pull this in and say, um, For instance, if we want to see Tycho, we check that and it shows us Tycho. So here's this crater down here at the bottom. Why is it moving off of my frame? <laughs> so there's Tycho. So then we can look here and find Tycho in real life. This is our, this is our real time image of the moon on the left. And this is our planetarium software on the right. So one at a time, we can kind of look at a crater and then go find it. So see Tycho in real time. And this crater here look at look over here. Let's just do I think this is gonna be crazy, but let's try it. Let's say um check all and then let's zoom in a little bit on our planetarium software and then center it again so it doesn't keep moving on us so copernicus is here so there's copernicus um Gassendi, boy, whenever I try this, Grinaldi, so this must be Grinaldi. Herman, right? And then would that be Kepler? Kim is on Omega Centauri. Wow, I wish we could see your scope, Kim. Kim says, the moon never disappoints. <laughs> Simon, 12 hours in front. Wow. I need to spend some time. Like, for instance, here's the Apollo 14 moon landing site. I just need to, there's told me. You should have told me so. Um, I should know this crater there. What is that? giant crater there. Is that Copernicus? Yeah, that must be Copernicus. Boy, you could study it in such detail and then see it live in such detail. 
can see where individual missions landed. There's Surveyor 6. And then find the exact spot in the real view of where each, each mission landed. Well, that's, uh, you know, the end of our two hours, but it is, um, it is true. Like Kim says, the moon never disappoints. Thank you for spending this time with us. Um, we are sorry that we've been now uh, wiped out by the morning light. I'm going to hang around here and just see if by chance I can spot Mercury. I mean, let's see if Mercury has risen yet. I know we're at our two hour We're at our two hour mark. It's not currently visible. It rises at 740. Oh my goodness. So we're an hour and 10 minutes before Mercury rises. I don't see how we're going to see it. Uh, but anyway, thanks for being with us for these two hours uh, early in the morning on this uh, April 19th morning in a cold spring morning here. Uh, thank you for making it a part of your day to start your day with us or depending on where you are in the world, end your day. Our friend Kim is down there in Australia and uh, he's uh, zooming in on Omega Centauri and I wish we could see that. Unfortunately, that's not visible to us in the Northern Hemisphere. So Kim will have to get you to snap a picture someday and send that to us, please, so we can at least see it live through your scope. Let's just quickly go here and say... Omega Centauri Wiki. This is what Kim is viewing in real time now down in Australia. It's a globular cluster in the constellation Centaurus was first identified non-stellar object by Edmund Haley, located 17,000 light years away. It's the largest known globular cluster in the Milky Way. It's uh, estimated to contain 10 million stars total mass equivalent to 4 million solar masses. It's the most massive known globular cluster in the whole Milky Way. And um, it's visible to the naked eye. So how about that? Omega Centauri, in honor of Kim. Omega Centauri, center on it. It is not visible from your location. Oh, maybe it is visible. It says it will reappear in your local sky tonight at 11 and will look best tomorrow morning at 116. So maybe it is visible in the nor northern hemisphere. I was thinking that it was only a southern hemisphere object. Peter, thank you for another, for your kind encouragement. Simon, thank you for your encouragement. You guys are great to um, cheer us on, and uh, we appreciate the encouragement. So it's showing us what it's going to look like at 1.17 a.m. It's very low in our sky, so, oh, yeah, look at that. Very low. I would say very low. <laughs> I don't know if we'll be able to ever pick that up or not, Kim. We'd rather see a picture from you, from your Southern Hemisphere view of it, please. So you'll have to send us a picture, please, Kim. Thank you a lot for being a part of this. We look forward to the next time around. If you don't mind, if you like content like this, would you please hit subscribe and a thumbs up and maybe even click that bell so that uh, you'll be notified when we do these live streams. Even if you don't want to, if you would consider it, I'm just kidding. But if you would, it doesn't cost you anything and that bumps it up in other people's um, um, algorithms of YouTube. Thank you for your uh, friendship and partnership with Emerald Hill Skies and we'll see you in the next one. God bless.